Okay, so we're going to pick up here in the second half of these notes to move on with uh, George Barclay. Now it's actually Barclay, not Berkeley. Bishop in the Church of Ireland and an idealist or immature. So like some of the other British philosophers we have covered, he is a monist, but he's unlike Hobbes and Hartley and others because they were materialists, right? But Barclay, on the other hand, is an immaterialist or an idealist. If you remember that, going back to chapter one, idealism is the idea that only ideas exist. There is no other physical reality, which is why we also say he's an immaterialist, to say there is no material reality out there. So if we think about things like the distinction between primary and secondary qualities, and remember how that kind of invokes a dualist view of things, that there's things out there in the world as they are, versus things as we experience them in the mind, Barclay says that it's only just the things that are experienced in the mind. So only secondary qualities exist. There are no primary qualities. They're not real at all. They don't exist at all. So secondary qualities exist, in which case we don't need to call them secondary qualities at all anymore because there's no reason to contrast them with primary. So we'll just say that they, they are experiential qualities. Right? It's the, it's the nature of experience. That's what's real. So Barclay says things, I says here, distance is not real. So Barclay was one of the first to really kind of tackle the whole problem of depth or distance perception and visual perception, which is a long-standing problem in, in the study of sensation and perception. The problem is that the eyes receive only two-dimensional input, right? The internal images created in the eyes are 2D, they're flat, but we experience a 3D world that has depth. So the question is, where does it come from? Barclay says it's just an idea. Right? It's not real. It's just an idea that the mind creates. The world itself, objects themselves, it's just not real. So, as it says here, for an object to have any quality, it must be perceived. All qualities are perceptual in nature. No primary qualities exist, only secondary. And he has this quote, to be is to be perceived, right? So for something to exist, it must be perceived. If it is not perceived, it does not exist. Which takes us into some funny territory now, right? Because we might ask this question, what do you mean? This pen, you're perceiving it. You can see it in the little video corner, right? So it exists, right? But now it's gone. Does that mean it doesn't exist anymore? What about, uh, you know, some place that you've been to before, but you're not there now, so you're not perceiving it. Let's say you're not at home. So is your home, is it, is it still there? Does it exist? Well, we're kind of claiming here maybe the answer is no, right? If it's not being perceived, Barclay claims, it does not exist. But this seems problematic, right? We don't, how can this really be true that, oh, hey, look, here's the pen again. Did it just pop back into existence despite the fact that we weren't perceiving it before? Well, Barclay's answer is it is being perceived but not necessarily by any human being. So human beings have a finite capacity for perception, right? We're only capable of perceiving what's right in front of us at any point in time. And of course our lifespans are relatively short. And so the idea is the world may have existed before we were born and may continue to exist after we were born, even though we're not perceiving it anymore, right? Because there is an ultimate perceiver, right? So Barclay now invokes God, and as I said, he's a, he's a bishop in the Church of Ireland, so he has a philosophical reason to want to try to justify and prove the existence of God. So God is omniscient, knowing all, right? But since, as an empiricist, knowledge is perception, Barclay says that omniscience means not just all-knowing, but it means all-seeing, all-perceiving. So uh, that's why, again, we have this term, the ultimate perceiver. So so Barclay says, basically, God is always perceiving everything. All of the, the, the reality that we experience is all just ideas in the mind of God, right? And so we experience it too, but nevertheless, it still boils down to all being ideas. And so he is an idealist, right? That's not a, that's not a, that's not a reality that exists independent of perception. It is just perception. Here's a little elaboration on Barclay's treatment of distance perception. He asks us to imagine a line presented in rise to the eye. So imagine looking straight down a, a line or even hold a pen like this one up to your eye. Don't 
poke your eye, but just look straight down the length of the pen and you can realize, of course, that you cannot see the length of the pen. You can only see the tip that's closest to your eye. And that's what I'm trying to draw in this picture here. If you can tell, that's a sideways view of an eye. That black circle is the pupil with the eyelids and a line with some dots presented lengthwise to the eye, but all those dots that have space or depth between them collapse to a single point on the back of the eye, the retina, because there's no depth in the internal imaging of the eye. And so the, the depth dimension is lost, the third dimension is lost. And so again, Barclay says that we just combine what he called depth cues that help us form an idea of distance, but again, it is not real, it's just the idea. So we have things like interposition. When two surfaces overlap each other, that's a cue that will cause the mind to uh, uh, associate this pattern with the idea of depth. Here is the issue of relative size, right, or familiar size, right? So we look at these, these uh, people, some in the foreground, some in the background, so there must be depth between them. But in this photograph, which is flat, there really is no depth. So the idea is that uh, the, 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 the guys in the background walking away from the camera up the trail there, they're actually quite smaller in the image. If we copy and paste one of those guys, we can see exactly how small he really is in the image. Though we don't even hardly even notice that. We don't really see him as being small. We see him as being farther away. So again, the, the, the change in relative size of objects uh, is again associated with depth in the mind to create the idea of distance. Familiar size, this is a bit of an outdated example because these telephones don't hardly exist anymore, but this, those phones are, you know, the size of about four apples in reality. So of course in this image for the phone and the apple to be uh, the same size in the image, we would have to know that there must be a different distance, that the apple was photographed close up in relation to the phone and so that that kind of uh, trick is used to create the appearance of uh, different same size right that's how for example in movies like the Lord of the Rings movies and the Hobbit movies with with hobbits and normal sized people around they were using these kinds of forced perspective tricks to have certain actors stand closer or farther from the camera without making it obvious now we get to Hume and Hume, in some ways, is very similar to Barclay. He believes that, yes, what we know is secondary qualities. In terms of saying that's what we can say exists, again, he would say, yes, what we can say exists is just what we experience with our senses. Nothing more, nothing less. And that's a, the crucial distinction here. Nothing more, nothing less. Hume says that what we know is real is what is experienced by the senses. Nothing more, nothing less. So where does this leave Barclay's God, his ultimate perceiver, omniscient, all-knowing, all all-perceiving uh, entity? Hume says we cannot experience God with our senses, so therefore we can make no claims about the existence of God. So Hume is a skeptic, uh, which we might say in, in terms of this, his religious view makes him an agnostic, right? Saying not being able to make a claim either for or against the existence of God because God cannot be experienced with the senses and therefore, as Hume says, cannot be known. In fact, it's well known that Hume actually leaned farther towards the negative side. He, he was an atheist. So without a God, without an ultimate perceiver, we're faced with that weird question again. How is it that, how, how do we explain the continuity of things? How can we say that these things exist? Here is my pen one more time. How can we say that this pen continued to exist uh, this whole time? even though we were not perceiving it. Well, Hume says simply, we can't. How do I know? I believe that the pen continued to exist even when it wasn't being perceived, but I do not know, right? So that's crucial as well, that Hume is drawing a distinction between what we believe to be true versus what we know to be true. And we can believe all kinds of things, but Hume says that those beliefs are not really justified. What we know is what's given to the senses. Any statements that we make that go beyond that would be gener generalizations, generalities, theories in the colloquial term, right? Um, but they are just that, right? And they are not experienced in any immediate direct way, so therefore we can't know them. 
In fact, this takes us into some interesting conclusions because we've talked about cause and effect before and how important causality and Newton's laws of physics and everything were important to some of those British empiricists. And Hume says that even that is problematic because when we talk about cause, what causes something to move? We said it earlier, it's a force. Force is what causes a mass to accelerate. There's the second law right there, F equals ma. But we can't see force, right? We can see an object move, so we can see its acceleration, but we can't see the force. It cannot, kind of like Star Wars, right? It can't be seen or directly experienced, right? It's going to be felt or whatever. But the idea is that you can't see it. So it's not, it's not experienced by the senses, and therefore we don't know that it exists. Hume says that the idea of a cause and effect relationship between two things, he, imagine uh, two, two billiard balls colliding, right? I'll use my hands here as an example. So one ball moves and it collides with another and then the second ball moves. So you get that chain reaction, so like that. We would normally look at that and think the first thing caused the second thing to move. But Hume says we don't know that. All that you have really seen is the motion of one thing followed by the motion of another thing. You've got a sequence of events. One thing moves, then another thing moves. And so what's going to happen is that we will repeatedly observe this sequence occurring over and over again. And so through associations, Hume says that we, we link these two events through this association that gets made. And this association causes us to believe that there is a necessary connection between those two movements. But we don't know there is a necessary connection. All that we have seen, and therefore all that we can really know, is one thing moved, and then another thing moved. Statements about the necessary connection between those movements, that is the cause and effect, cannot be justified, right? And therefore force cannot be justified. It's all just mental belief, mental habit, as Hume called it. We are in the habit of attributing causality to these events. But that's all that it is. It's an attribution. So to explain how the pen continues to exist, Hume calls it the law of similarity. It's another association. This pen that you are now perceiving, which you previously did, it looks the same as the last pen you saw. How do you know it's the same one? You don't, according to Hume, but because it is similar, then you form an association between them and you attribute identity to this object. But again, it's just mental habit. So as we've said, he's a skeptic, not just about God with his agnosticism or atheism, but a skeptic about pretty much a lot of things about the physical world. How do we know that cause and effect is a principle of the world? How do we know that physics is telling us about the underlying principles that govern the universe? We simply don't know. We only know what's given to the senses. Anything beyond that may not be anything at all, right? Again, this idea of how do we explain the continuity of the external world, right? If I close my eyes, the world disappears. But I open my eyes and everything comes back just the way it was before. How do I explain that the world continued to exist? Hume says we don't know it. We just believe it because when I open my eyes, the world looks the same as it did before. So again, based on the law of similarity, I think the world existed the entire time, but maybe it didn't. It could have, in Hume's view, popped out of existence and popped right back into existence, and our experiences would have been the same. And because our experiences would have been the same, how can we really know what was real? Maybe we don't like this skepticism, and in fact, it's not going to take long for one of Hume's own fellow countrymen. Hume was from Scotland, and Thomas Reed, is going, uh, another Scotsman, is going to criticize it. Reed's approach is called common sense uh, empiricism. Actually, some people have sometimes labeled Reed an irrationalist, but I, I don't know that I totally agree with that, but we don't need, we don't need to be too concerned with that particular debate. So if we recall, just to summarize Hume here, he's saying that there's a lot of things like causality and force that we cannot know, that we only believe these things. They only exist as mental habit. He's a skeptic and an agnostic. Combine that with the passivity of, of knowledge, right? So Hume does believe in the associationistic view of knowledge that we receive these sensations and then we start forming the associations between 
these sensations. But again, once we start making these higher level associations, this is going to take our knowledge beyond the senses into all of this other stuff, like all of these habits and beliefs and things that we have that don't correspond to reality. So now what's happening is that all of these categories that we build up, like dog and, and cat and circles and color, all this stuff that we think exists as as entities in the world, they are really just associations made in the mind that we have no control over. Um, so this is not just a skeptical view of human knowledge, but it's actually very negative because not only do, do the ideas that we think we have not correspond to anything that may be real, but we don't even have any control over forming these ideas. We are passively receiving sensations and we are passively at the mercy of the laws of association. And, as Thomas Reed says here at the bottom, this is all a violation of common sense. It just doesn't make any sense that this is the way the human mind works or the way human knowledge works. But it's not just common sense in that view. Thomas Reed is using the word common sense to explain the commonality of our sensory impressions of the world, our perception of the world. If I see this pen as blue and you see this pen as blue, we experience it as a common object. We, common, we have the same common experience, right? It's common to you and me. So therefore, Reed says that th this gives us some room for objectivity of our knowledge, right? That we are both experiencing the same external reality. Um, and therefore, we are perceiving a world. And this is, applies not just to some object like this pen, but it applies to other things like cause and effect. So if I look at two things, colliding and I say the first cause the second and you look at that and conclude the same thing, we are having the same common experience of the same common objective reality. And so that we, yes, we can perceive causality when it really happens. And that causality is not just some mental habit that only happens when a sequence happens. And as an example of this, Reed has a nice counter rebuttal here to um, Hume's claim about the law of sequence, right? One thing happens, then another thing happens, and then we just passively form an association. We can't control it. So Reed says, if that's true, then we have to form uh, an association about cause and effect for every sequence that we experience. And Reed points out that one of the most ubiquitous sequences that we experience every day of our life is that day is followed by night and night is followed by day. So therefore, if, we, if Hume's analysis is correct, we would, all humans must have to believe that day causes night and night causes day. But we don't, right? And since we don't believe that, this just becomes a simple proof that Hume is wrong, right? That there can, in fact, be many sequences in the world that we do not attribute causality to. Only certain sequences do we attribute causality to them, and those are the ones that are actually really cause and effect types of events. So Reed says that we just have the ability to correctly see what's going on in the world, right? And this is an example of what we would call direct perception, which we haven't really talked about yet, right? Every, all of these perceptual theories that we've been talking about could be labeled indirect, because what we're aware of is not a, a world, but it's really just ideas, right? Simple ideas or sensations or whatever, which are generally treated as being meaningless. And so... Got a cat here. So we have this idea that um, what we know is really what's just the senses. And beyond the senses out there in the world, we're disconnected from that. So we are only indirectly perceiving the world. So I think we've used this metaphor before. If not, this is like speaking to someone who speaks another language. Right? That person says something in their language. You hear that, but it's meaningless to you. You have no idea what it means because you don't know that language. But if you have a translator, somebody who can come in between, the, uh, the, the person says something in their language, the translator turns to you and says, hello. Now, what do you know? If you Basically, the idea is you know that the translator has told you hello. You do not know that the other person really, in fact, said hello. And this is really the issue that Hume is getting at here, right? Hume is saying that you're kind of at the mercy of your translator. You know what your senses tell you about reality, but not reality, because the senses are working as the translator between the external physical world and the internal mental world, right? There's a little dualism in that too, right? There's dualism in this disconnection between in here and out there, and that's the nature of indirect perception. 
And so Locke, of course, gave us a dualist view with its primary and secondary qualities. And so this keeps taking us into this idea that we're only aware of what's going on in our own minds and not of an external reality, which sounds a lot like the Matrix and, and uh, Descartes' brain in a vat and Plato's uh, allegory of the cave and all these, these problems, right? How do we know that the senses are really giving us an accurate depiction of reality? And just like with the translator problem, you don't know unless you have another way, an independent way of verifying your translator. If you don't have an independent way of verifying your senses, you don't really know if your senses are telling you the truth. Which, of course, I think the Greeks understood all along, and that's why they abandoned empiricism in favor of rationalism and innate knowledge, because they could escape the skepticism. But if you're John Locke and you're going to argue for a blank slate, and then so is Hume, you're going to say that uh, there's no way to avoid skepticism. Hume, in particular, is pointing out the ultimate uh, upshot of all of his thinking is that this kind of knowledge through sensation, with sensations being un having an unknown relationship to the outside world, um, leads to skepticism and nominalism as well. Again, all these things are just names and ideas in the mind that we don't know correspond to reality. And Reed says no. We directly perceive the world, right? That sensations are not really translators, they're just a step to get from out there to in here. Sometimes it's called naive realism. The idea is that it's naive in the sense that I don't question my senses, I just accept that the world as I experience it is the world as it really is. So direct perception, direct realism is that, that, that we directly perceive the world as it is and as I said, also naive realism because of this unquestioning nature of, of experience. This chart that I like kind of represents uh, a way we can visualize how perception is thought to work. So in this view, what we have, if you follow my mouse cursor here, the distal stimulus is some object in the world. That's supposed to be a tree, right? But I've drawn it in a way that matches our experience, but if we're really taking this dualist view of things with primary and secondary qualities, how that tree really is in the world, we don't really know. That's the distal stimulus, meaning it's a stimulus for our experience, but it's at some distance from us. But light will arrive at our eye, that's what this is, and eye, so that's the proximal stimulus, is the light rays come into contact with the body. But again, this is still in the physical, external reality. But this causes the sensations or simple ideas, right, experiences of color, which then get built up from sensation to perception. So again, with associationism, we're going to do some kind of bottom-up processing to get from sensation to perception. Notice the divided line here, and that's the physical on the left side and the psychological on the right side. So there's dualism implicit in this treatment. But since what we know inside the mind starts with sensations, and we don't know what's going on be out, th out there beyond them, because again, this is the, you know, the translation from the language of the physical reality to the language of the mental reality occurs. We don't know if we trust our translator. So we build up this idea of a tree. Uh, that's what I'm seeing. It's a tree. But how do I know that this mental tree here actually corresponds to this physical tree out there? And... Locke says, we just do. It, it, it all works, right? He's not going to, he doesn't want to be a skeptic. Locke is actually uh, quite uh, uh, distasteful of, of skepticism, and, and he says, if I'm seeing a tree, it's because there is a tree. But Hume, not quite so distasteful of skepticism, says, there's no way to know. I know what my senses have told me, and that's all that I know. That's what Hume's theory then looks like. Anything on the left side of the line out there in the world that, that, that's beyond sensations, we don't know anything about that. We know what is given to our sensations and only what is given to our sensations. As I said before, nothing more, nothing less. And here's Reed's version. We don't have to worry about sensations as a translator anymore. Sensations, as I said, play some role as a step in the process to get us from the physical to the, importantly here, physiological. So part of the issue here is the entire dualism that's been going on. Perception can only be direct if we eliminate that dividing line between psychological reality and physical reality. And 
So the external tree becomes an internal tree, or the physical tree becomes a physiological tree, whatever you want to call it, but the idea is that the awareness is much more direct and immediate. And that would be Reed's direct uh, naive realism. Now this idea of, of common experience, uh, forming some, some kind of objective knowledge, is, is heavily influential in science because of this guy, Auguste Comte. Comte is, um, he has some pretty negative opinions about religion and superstition, and he believes that these things have caused problems with humanity for years and years, and he wants to invent essentially a new religion, a religion of science, that uh, can provide a more uh, positive view of humanity, right? And uh, so he has to, of course, to do this, uh, create a definition of science. What is it that makes a, a claim scientific as opposed to unscientific or superstitious or uh, pseudoscientific or whatever? And so it has to be observed, right? And so if observation can tell us about something that is objectively true, we have to start trusting our senses. We have to believe that perception is not just a subjective experience, but is, is of an objective reality. But of course, what's crucial in defining positivism for Comte is this idea of objective observation, that is, public observation, right? More than one person. We have to, multiple people, to, in order to say something is real, multiple people have to observe it, and they have to agree on their observations. Ideally, if you could measure it and put some numbers on it, that would be even good too, so you would quantify your observations. When you do that, you have this kind of objective, common experience, um, that would be scientific. And that's what counts as positive knowledge. You can make a positive claim about something because we can demonstrate it as, as real, because we can all observe it. If only one person can see it, that's when it becomes subjective. So this is Comte's main criticism with mysticism and religion, is that all of these kinds of spiritual experiences people have are private and inner and subjective, and therefore that can't really form the basis of a positive claim. I've already suggested all oh, this British empiricism is taking us towards behaviorism, but certainly um, it, this, is, this kind of positivism is also relevant because when it comes to talking about the mind, um, this is not something we can see. Right? We can't see the mind of other people. We can only see the behavior of others. Now, we can experience our own minds, but that requires introspection. And that's where the observations are more personal and subjective. So therefore, that cannot be science. Right? Internal, introspective uh, observation of your own thoughts and feelings is not scientific. You have to have a public observation, an objective observation. And when it comes to human behavior and psychology, that can only apply to um, outward responses, right? We can observe people's behavior, and multiple people can observe these behaviors. So this means we're not going to theorize about mind that cannot be observed or any of these other metaphysical claims that go beyond observation. We, can, we should only be talking about what we can justify with observation. And that's a way of defining science. Science is about observation, empiricism, objectively. And that's what positivism is about. Now, this is kind of an old-fashioned view of science. There are going to be some 20th century variations called logical positivism, and we will talk about them in, when we get to the chapter that deals more with behaviorism and, and how it's related to philosophy of science. There's actually another version of positivism that's worth bringing up real quick. Ernst Mach, who was a physicist, actually, sided with Berkeley. He believed that Berkeley was onto something when he said that to be is to be perceived and that when we when we say when we're talking about reality what we're really talking about is we're talking about sensations. We're talking about what we have perceived and what we experience. So unlike a lot of approaches to science where a lot of times people will say that physics is the primary science and biology or chemistry reduces to physics and biology reduces to chemistry and psychology reduces to biology so each, in turn, everything reduces to, to physics. Berkeley reversed that, and he said everything reduces to psychology, because if, if ideas represent the primary subs, uh, substance of reality, then the primary science is psychology. Physics will reduce to psychology, rather than the other way around. And so, from his view, which is kind of ironic coming from a physicist to actually say that, um, there is no such thing as objective observation because there is no external reality to objectively observe that ultimately 
science is the study of sensations, and that's much more subjective and internal. So that, that throws a wrench into our definition of science, but I just want to uh, throw that out there as one of the other perspectives that exist. And that is the end of chapter five. Thank you.